Hi friends, how are you all doing? I am sure you have done some additional reading with regard to our previous two lessons in which we discussed about evolution of cities, ancient cities, medieval cities as well as modern cities and we also have tried to understand the difference between pre-industrial and industrial cities. From now on till coming 3-4 sessions, we have a slightly different concerns with regard to urban sociology where we will try to understand some critical theories with regard to the emergence and development of urban sociology. I have observed in general experience that many students, many friends, many learners, they are not very comfortable with theories. But let me tell you my dear friends, theories is like the backbone. Without a spinal cord support, if the human body cannot stand, we all are aware of that. Similarly, theories provide that kind of framework, that kind of stiffness to any discipline. But I promise you that every theory which we will be discussing, which we will be understanding will definitely help you to understand much better about cities and urban centers and you will thoroughly enjoy this learning. So to begin with in this particular session our concentration will be on three very very important thinkers. I will just let you know their names in couple of minutes but before that we know that urban sociology is a well established subfield of sociology that seeks to study and explain the structures, processes, changes and problems and formulate theories. The explanation and research provides the inputs for planning and policy making. It is the sociological study of cities and their role in the development of society. Urban sociology theories are significant to understand urban phenomenon and change. The classical theories of urban sociology are divided from the works of European sociologists like Emil Durkheim, Ferdinand Tonez, George Simmel, Max Weber and those of Americans namely Park Burgess, Lewis Worth and Robert Field. In this particular session, I am sure you must be curious which thinkers we will begin our discussion with. In this particular lesson, our focus will be on three very prominent thinkers, Emile Durkheim, Ferdinand Tonez and George Simmel. Before I talk more in detail about Emile Durkheim, I want to tell you certain very interesting things about Durkheim. We all know that father of sociology is August Comte and to surprise of many of us, August Comte had never so studied sociology as a subject. He was basically a mathematician and physicist. But if you study about August Comte and his contributions, he made all possible efforts to make sociology the queen of social sciences. See what a beautiful feeling sometimes when I am teaching or when I am reading August Comte, I feel so inspired that though he never studied sociology as a subject, he was very keen to make sociology bring it on the top and that is why in some of his writings he also mentions that sociology is the crowning edifice. What a beautiful term. Emile Durkheim, Emile Durkheim is considered as the first academic sociologist and when you talk about his contributions with regard to Emile Durkheim, you must be wondering that how Durkheim is talking about cities, why is he talking about cities. Emile Durkheim is also one of the founding fathers of sociology along with Max Weber, Karl Marx, Herbert Spencer. But Emil Durkheim was the one who studied sociology as a subject and it was part of his educational qualification. 
and he is one of the founding thinkers and he was born in France on April 15th, 1858. Durkheim's body of work as a researcher and theorist focused on how society can form and function which is another way of saying how it can maintain order and stability. This we see in his popular writings like division of labor in society and the elementary forms of religious life. Friends, I am tempted to say a few more things about Durkheim before we discuss in detail about his contributions in urban sociology. He was the one who has done a detailed study about suicides. Suicide which is considered to be a contemporary phenomenon, but Durkheim in early 1900s he did a wonderful study and he has come up with types of suicides. So, though the contributions of Durkheim what we are going to discuss now is in a slightly different perspective, but when we talk about urban social problems, suicide is also very, very critical challenge and I think in this context also we should definitely read and remember Durkheim. Apart from suicide, his very beautiful book is Elementary Forms of Religious Life. Again, this writing is in direct connection with the contemporary urban world, not only in India as well as globally. See, Durkheim is talking about the integrating functions of religion. In today's time, in most of my discussions in the class, when I ask students and I am asking all of you also that how do you see religion? Unfortunately, most of the responses come that religion is disintegrating factor. Probably our experiences in contemporary times are like that and that is why we think like that. But Durkheim focused on the integrating functions of religion and that is why when we talk about urban religion or uh, communal rights challenges in urban areas, I think we have lot to learn from Durkheim also. Durkheim was most interested in the glue that holds the society together, which means he focused on the shared experiences, perspectives, values, beliefs and behaviors that allow people to feel that they are a part of a group and that working together to maintain the group is in their common interest. He considered social structure of city and evolved the concept of social solidarity that is the bond between all individuals within a society. He developed model of contrasting social order types, mechanical solidarity and organic solidarity. So, what is mechanical solidarity? It refers to social bonds constructed on likeness and largely dependent upon common beliefs, customs, rituals, routines and symbol and people are identical in major ways and thus united almost automatically and such societies are self-sufficient. Social cohesion is based upon the likeness and similarities among individuals in a society. It is common mechanical solidarity is common among prehistoric and pre-agricultural societies and reduces in predominance as modernity increases in the society. The cohesion and integration is due to homogeneity in society with mechanical solidarity. People feel connected through similar work, educational and religious training and lifestyle. Mechanical solidarity normally operates in traditional and small scale societies and it is usually based on kinship ties of familial networks. Before I proceed with organic solidarity friends, I once again want to emphasize on two very important concepts. As students of sociology or as students of urban sociology, 
homogeneity and heterogeneity these are two very very critical concepts for us to explain the diversity in social phenomenon so when durkheim is talking about mechanical solidarity he is saying homogeneity now for example take a village or take a tribal group people living in a tribal community or people living in a village they have lot many things in similarities they have a similar occupation similar lifestyle similar ways of thinking similar norms and values and that is why we say that village communities and tribal communities are homogeneous in nature in contrast to homogeneity heterogeneity heterogeneity is diversity and diversity why diversity because people in cities or in complex societies they have different occupations different lifestyles different ways of thinking so organic solidarity is the social order based on social differences complex division of labor where many different people specialize in many different occupations greater freedom and choice for city inhabitants despite acknowledged impersonality alienation disagreement and conflict undermined traditional social integration but created a new form of social cohesion based on mutual interdependence it is liberating social cohesion based on dependence individuals in more advanced society have on each other friends none of you asked me that what do we mean by alienation probably you are thinking in your mind and i have read your mind so when i'm talking about alienation it is definitely it derives from the word alien now alienation as a concept we also come across when we discuss about karl marx in fact karl marx das kapital has detailed explanation about this alienation in a very common explanation alienation see the word alienation alien alien is the word we usually use to uh, denote something which is outside us so in modern cities where there is organic solidarity what is happening is people who are producing goods and this i am talking in terms of karl marx explanation people who are producing goods people who are make uh, putting in all their time their effort their energy to create a particular product they are not in a position to own that product and that is why karl marx is saying that a worker he has produced the product but he is not able to have control on that product so the product is becoming alien to the worker and that is why probably durkheim also thought that alienation is an important component in cities and which is predominated by organic solidarity common among industrial societies as the division of labor increases though individuals perform different tasks and often have different values and interests the order and very survival of society depends on their reliance on each other to perform their task organic solidarity is social cohesion based upon dependence individuals have on each other in more advanced societies it comes from the interdependence that arises from specialization of work and the complementarities between people a development that occurs in modern and industrial societies although individuals perform different tasks and often have different values and interests the order and very solidarity of society depends on their reliance on each other to perform their specified tasks organic refers to the interdependence of the component parts thus 
social solidarity is maintained in more complex societies through interdependence of its component parts. For example, farmers produce the food to feed the factory workers who produce the tractors that allow the farmer to produce the food. So, there is a interdependence. As a simple example, farmers produce food to feed factory workers who produce tractors that in end allow the farmer to produce more food. Friends, let me give you one more very simple example. And I would also like to bring in Herbert Spencer here. You must be wondering that Vinita already three thinkers are there and why am I introducing one more thinker? But that is what we have to understand their interplay. Now see for example, human body is there. In human body, every part, every organ has its own respective functions. For example, eyes is there, eyes with eyes we see, then with hands we eat food, we do all our work, legs we use to walk, different organs, different functions. But there is such a beautiful interdependence of these parts. Now see, just imagine, it's just only a hypothetical example. Just imagine that suddenly you see a snake in front of you. What do you do? So the moment your eyes see the snake, right? Your eyes will send the signal immediately to your brain that see that there is some kind of a threat to your life. And the moment eyes send the signal to uh, your brain, brain prepares the entire body and that is how our heartbeat starts increasing. And if there is a stick nearby, your brain will immediately tell to your hand, okay, take the stick and shoo away the snake. And if there is no such defense for you, then your brain tells to your legs, okay, there is no defense for you, you run from here. So we are seeing a wonderful interdependence of the parts and that is what Durkheim is trying to tell us. Durkheim is trying to tell us that in society also, especially in societies with organic solidarity, this kind of interdependence is there. Now you must be wondering that why did I take the name of Herbert Spencer? Because it was Herbert Spencer who compared the human organism, not exactly human organism, any living organism with society in his wonderful theory called as organic analogy. And I would sincerely request all of you to please do uh, some reading on that, though it is not directly part of urban sociology, but I am sure you will love reading Herbert Spencer also. Ferdinand Tonis was a German sociologist and philosopher and his writings also is prominent in urban sociology. He was a major contributor to sociological theory and field studies and is best known for his distinction between two types of social groups, Gemeinschaft and Gesellschaft. He co-founded German Society for Sociology of which he was president from 1909 to 1933 after which he was ousted for having criticized the Nazis. Tonis was considered the first German sociologist who published over 900 works and contributed to many areas of sociology and philosophy. Tonis defined and described two basic organizing principles of human association or two contrasting types of human social life, a typology with the continuum of pure type of settlement, Gemeinschaft that is community and Gesellschaft that is association. Gemeinschaft is characterized by a village kind of a life and has an essential unity of purpose work together for the common good, united by ties of family, kinship, neighborhood, land worked communally, that is together by inhabitants, social life which is characterized by intimate, private and exclusive living together, members bound by common language and traditions, recognized common goods as well as evils 
common friends and enemies, sense of weakness or awareness and human. On the other hand, Gesellschaft, which is association, is characterized by large city and city life is a mechanical aggregate characterized by disunity, rampant individualism and selfishness, meaning of existence shifts from group to individual, rational, very calculating, each person understood in terms of a particular role and service provided, it deals with the artificial construction of an aggregate of human beings which superficially resembles the gemin shaft in so far as the individuals peacefully live together. Yet, whereas in gemin shaft, people are united in spite of all separating factors, in gesal shaft, people are separated in spite of all uniting factors. There are three types of gemin shaft relationships kinship, friendship and neighborhood or locality. Tony's was ultimately interested in social change. Through the concept of Jimin Shaft and Gesell Shaft, he tried to explain the evolution of society from ancient to modern. He saw ancient society as predominantly rooted in the essential will where families, tribes and villages functioned around common heritage. People predominantly used essential will for the benefit of the whole group. In more developed societies, however, the relationship between people are based on arbitrary will with social structure formed around common interests. People in such societies predominantly use arbitrary will based on their own interest choosing between different means to fulfill certain individual needs. Tony's, however, did not see modern society as exclusively based in arbitrary will, but as a mix of the two. In this conception, every social organization is a synthesis of the two wills. Tony's also contributed to the study of social change, particularly on public opinion, customs and technology, crime and suicide. He also had a vivid interest in methodology, especially statistics and sociological research, inventing his own technique of statistical association. The Ferdinand Tony's Society was founded in 1956 in Kiel with vision of furthering social research in honor of Ferdinand Tonis as one of the founders of German sociology. George Simmel was born in Berlin and received his doctorate in 1881. Simmel's ideas were very influential on the Marxist scholar George Lucas and Simmel's writings on the city and on money are now being used by contemporary sociologists. Simmel combines ideas from major classical writers and was influenced by Hegel and Kant. When Simmel discusses social structures, the city, money and modern society, his analysis has some similarities to the analysis of Durkheim with specific reference to problem of individual and society and with regard to Weber, effects of rationalization and Karl Marx with reference to alienation. Simmel considered society to be an association of free individuals and said that it could not be studied in the same way as the physical world. That is, sociology is more than the discovery of natural laws that govern human interaction. 
for simil society is made up of the interactions between and among individuals and the sociologist should study the patterns and forms of these associations rather than quest after social laws this emphasis on social interaction of the individual and small group level and viewing the study of these interactions as the primary task of sociology makes simmel's approach different from that of the classical writers like marx and durkheim after industrial revolution sociologists such as max weber and george simmel began to focus on the accelerating process of urbanization and the effects it had on the feelings of social alienation and anonymity george simmel is widely considered to be the father of urban sociology for his contribution to the field in works such as the metropolis and mental life published in 1903 Simmel was originally asked to lecture on the role of intellectual life in Berlin but he effectively reversed the topic in order to analyze the effects of urbanity on the mind of the individual Simmel argues that urban life irreversibly transforms one's mind Simmel does not say that these changes are negative but writes that the structural forces on socialization are particularly strong in an urban milieu simmel deliberated on importance of urban experience that is he chose to focus on urbanism life within the city rather than urbanization that is development of urban areas the unique trait of modern city is intensification of nervous stimuli with which city dweller must cope from rural setting where rhythm of life and sensory imagery is slower habitual to city with constant bombardments of sights sounds smells individual learns to discriminate become rational and calculating and develops a buyer's attitude a social reserve a detachment and responds with head rather than heart and with some element of indifference how true simmel was urbanites are highly attuned to time and strong orientation of rationality is expressed in advanced economic division of labor and the use of money because of requirement for a universal means of exchange urbanism acknowledges freedom transcendence of pettiness of daily routine new heights of personal and spiritual development but sense of alienation could override this according to simmel social scientists focus on two aspects of social life in urban areas the first aspect is how social interactions are shaped by urban environments and how social interactions in urban environments are distinct from social interactions in other contexts secondly how the architecture and the physical space of a city influence social interactions this is addressed by urban planners architects and by the experts of sociology of architecture and sociology of space in george simmel's essay the metropolis and mental life he illustrates how modern city life has necessitated an inner scuffle to describe and uphold personal individuality he sees the deepest problem of modern life as being the struggle not to become anonymous and homogenized swallowed whole by the vast crowds of the city 
indifference, intellectualism and reservation are relied on in this process and in turn this separates the individual from the group facilitating an environment that is poor in personal connections, wealth, obsessed and culturally dull. Elaborating on urban social life, Simmel says that in the city as opposed to the rural lifestyle, there is much less public interest in another person's lifestyle and activities. With higher density of urban populations, both mundane and the more personal, religious, political, sexual aspects of an individual are under much less inquiry in the city and this frees people to live as they want. He compares this to the rural environment where people have many more connections to those around them and so they may live in a more culturally ascribed way. In a crowded city, human interactions are short and functional and an individual becomes usually indifferent in their self-ascribed relationship to many people they interact at a daily basis. This leads to isolation in a crowd. That is why we say in Hindi, bheed may be hokar akela rehna which contrasts the rural environment that bases relationships on emotional connection and a lifelong knowledge of persons. Overstimulation also leads to what Simmel calls the psychological blaze attitude that is one where senses are numbed and differences between experiences go unnoticed. As a person loses their ability to differentiate experiences and ascribe importance to them, they struggle with identity. Thus, individual personalities become increasingly specialized in cities and Simmel attributes an economic value to this specialization of individuality. He says that this quantitative importance proceeds to overshadow all that is qualitative. It changes the way that people interact with their environment and others. It makes objects lose their importance apart from monetary value. The personality specialization of individuals leads to growth of intellectualism and logical thinking. Although Simmel believes that they lack in the cultural mind. A person may rely so much on intellectual thought to create sense in his urban world that he loses sight of creative subjective thought beyond the scope of whoever he has chosen to present himself as. This cultural gap means that city dwellers become more unidimensional, thinking only in one dimension. According to Simmel's theory, through ascription to the blaze attitude, urbanites carve out personalities that are especially suited for life in an overpopulated, overstimulated place. Because the city is so impersonal and objective, such an onslaught to the mental mind, individuals try hard to be unique in whatever way possible, often to the point of losing their connection with the qualitative aspects of culture and society that are so ingrained in rural life in essence. Simmel is a functionalist theory that claims that we adapt to the society in which we live in order to maintain the structure of that particular society. Friends, in this session we have tried to understand and discuss about the contributions of three very prominent social thinkers, Emile Durkheim, Ferdinand Tonis and George Simmel. Though the discussion was very brief, 
but there are many many aspects which we can further ingrain with more of reading which i request you all to do in case of any questions any doubts any observations or any further explanations please feel free to write to me on pandevini at gmail dot com and i will meet you very soon with another session of wonderful thinkers belonging to the ecological school and specially the chicago school of thought urban ecology is the soul of urban sociology and we will continue this discussion in our forthcoming session thank you so much for being with me have a great time enjoy be safe bye bye